Chapter six of the British Army from Within by E. Charles Vivian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six Artillery and Engineers. The Royal Artillery of the British Army is divided into three branches, known respectively as Horse, Field, and Garrison Artillery. In normal times, the Royal Horse Artillery consists of some 28 batteries, distinguished by the letters of the alphabet, together with a depot and a writing establishment. On parade, the Horse Artillery batteries take precedence of all other units, with the exception of Household Cavalry. The Royal Field Artillery consists of 150 batteries and four depots, and the Royal Garrison Artillery consists of 100 companies and nine mountain batteries. A battery of the Royal Horse is officially designated the Chestnut Troop from the color of its horses, and the Horse Artillery as a whole is one of the few corps of the service which retains the stable jacket for parade use. In the case of the RHA, this garment is of dark blue with yellow braid, and the headdress of the horse gunner is a busby with white plume and scarlet busby bag similar to that of the Hussars. The field and garrison artillery wear tunics in full dress, and their helmets are surmounted by a ball instead of a spike. While the weapon of the field artillery is the 18-and-a-half-pounder quick-firing gun, and gunners ride on the gun and limber, the RHA is armed with a 13-pounder quick-firing gun, and its gunners are mounted on horseback. The object of this is to obtain extreme mobility. The Royal Horse are expected to be able to execute all their maneuvers at a gallop, and to get into and out of action more quickly than the field artillery. They are designed especially to accompany cavalry in flying column work. Their mobility is only achieved by a sacrifice of weight in the projectile which the gun throws, and they are only expected to hold a position supported by cavalry until the heavier guns come into play. The horse gunners may be regarded as the scouts of the artillery, in the sense in which the cavalry are the scouts of the whole army. Since in the Royal Horse gunners as well as drivers are mounted, the number of horses to a battery is greater than in the field artillery, and work is consequently harder. Officers of the Royal Horse are specially selected from the RFA, to which they return on promotion, and the rank and file are picked men chosen for physique and smartness. It is a maxim of the service that the work of the RHA is never done, and when one takes into account the fact that gunners have a horse and saddle apiece to care for, as well as their gun, while drivers have two horses and two sets of harness apiece to keep in condition, it will be seen that there is a certain amount of truth in the statement. In old times, when field day and maneuver parades were carried through in review order, the horse gunner was eternally in debt over the matter of the yellow braid with which his stable jacket is adorned, for these jackets are particularly difficult to keep clean. The general adoption of service dress for working parade has neutralized this disability. The horse gunner of today is a very good soldier indeed in every respect, both by real aptitude for his work and by compulsion. Not that the men of the field artillery are not equally good soldiers, for they are. The field artillery, however, divides itself naturally into two branches, drivers and gunners. Each driver has two horses and two sets of harness to manage, and if the cavalryman has reason to grouse at the length of time he spends at stable, the driver of the field has more than four times as much reason to grouse. Moreover, the cavalryman is permitted to clean his saddlery during the official stable hour, but drivers of the RFA are expected to concentrate their attention on their horses during the time that they are officially at stable. They can stay in the stables and get their sets of harness cleaned and fit for inspection in their own time. They are then at liberty to clean up their own personal equipment, and until the turn for guard comes round, have the rest of their time to themselves. Gunners of the RFA have all their time taken up by the care of the gun, its fittings and appointments, as well as by the various separate instruments connected with the use of a gun. For instance, all arms of the service possess and make use of range-finding instruments known as micometers, 
but in the artillery the micometer is a larger and more complicated affair for the range of the gun is several times greater than that of the rifle and range finding is consequently a far more complex business the simple gunner must understand this just as he must understand the business of laying or adjusting the sights of the gun to the required range the use of telescopic sights the delicate mechanism of the breech block the method of putting the gun out of action or rendering it useless in case of emergency and a hundred and one other things which involve really complicated technical knowledge and lie in the province of the commissioned officer rather than in that of the private soldier the reason for teaching these things to the private soldier lies in the accumulated experience which shows that on many occasions all the officers and non-commissioned officers of a battery have been blown to pieces by the enemy's fire and there have remained only a few private soldiers to do their own work and that of their officers as well it is to the eternal credit of the army and especially to that of the artillery that men thus placed have never once failed to do their duty nobly and the present war has already afforded more than one instance of single men sticking to their guns to the last desertion of the guns has never been charged against british artillery nor is it ever likely to be field guns are always accompanied by an escort sometimes of cavalry but more often of infantry for the gunner is admittedly helpless against infantry at close range or against charging cavalry the charge of the light brigade at balaclava forms an instance of what cavalry can do against unescorted guns and though the pattern of gun in use has changed for the better the projectile being far more powerful and the number of shells per minute far greater such feats as that of the immortal light brigade are still within the range of possibility the business of the gunner in an army assuming the offensive is to open the attack the fuse of the shrapnel shell is so timed that the missile which contains a quantity of bullets and a bursting charge of powder shall explode immediately over the position held by the enemy when a sufficient number of shells have been fired to weaken resistance the infantry advance in order to drive the enemy from the chosen position in defensive action the use of the gun lies in retarding the advance of the enemy and inflicting as much damage as possible before rifles and machine guns can come into play for this business ranges must be taken swiftly and accurately loading must be performed expeditiously and though the pneumatic recoil of the modern field gun renders it far less liable to shift in action the sights must be correctly aligned after each shot a gun crew must work swiftly and without confusion and peace training is devoted to attaining that quickness and thorough efficiency which renders a battery formidable in war there is perhaps less show about the work of a gunner than in that of any other arm of the service with the exception of the royal engineers a good bit of his work is extremely dirty cleaning a gun for instance after firing practice with smokeless powder is a hopelessly messy business and the infantryman who pulls his rifle through and extracts the fouling in about five minutes would feel sorry for himself if he were called on to share in the work of cleaning the bore of an eighteen and a half pounder after firing practice there is a considerable amount of drill of a complicated nature which the field gunner has to learn in addition to ordinary foot drill there is all the mechanism of the gun to be understood there are courses in range finding gun laying signaling and other things and on the whole it is not surprising that it takes at least five years to render a field gunner thoroughly conversant with his work the finished article is rather a business-like man quieter as a rule in his ways than his fellows in the cavalry and infantry rather serious and little given to boasting about the excellence of service in the royal field artillery he knows his worth and that of his arm too well to waste breath in declaring them the driver of the field artillery has even more of riding school work to do than the average cavalryman it would be idle to say that he is a better rider for the average cavalryman is as good a rider as it is possible for a man to be artillery horse however are heavy and unhandy compared with cavalry mounts 
and the driver has not only to drive the horse he rides, but has also to lead and control the horse abreast of his own. The principal responsibility for the path which the gun takes lies with the lead or foremost driver, though almost as much responsibility is entailed on the man controlling the wheel or rearmost horses, and compared with these two, the center driver has an easy time of it in mounted drill and field work. Notwithstanding the extremely hard work to which drivers of artillery are subjected, the same trouble over harness as obtains over cavalry saddlery is experienced in some batteries. Soft soap and oil are the cleaning materials prescribed by the regulations, but certain battery commanders enforce the use of steel link burnishers on steel work and brilliant polish on leather, the last named polish being obtained by the use of a mysterious combination of heel ball turpentine, harness composition, and according to legend, old soldier's breath. The mixture is known among the drivers as fake, and fake and burnish is synonymous with unending work in the stable. It is the fetish of smartness, a misdirected enthusiasm, which brings things like this to pass and inflicts extra work on men whose energy should be devoted solely to the attaining of fitness for active service where fake and burnish have no place. The Royal Horse and Royal Field Artillery are the only branches of the service in which substantial prizes are given annually to encourage men in their work. In each battery, three money prizes are offered for competition among the drivers. The amounts offered are substantial, and the general result is a spirit of healthy emulation, though far too often, and with the full sanction of the battery officer, this degenerates into the fake and burnish craze. This, however, is not the fault of the prize-giving system, but of the officers who not only permit, but encourage, and even order this unnecessary work, which, while entailing added labor on the men, assists in the deterioration of the leather work in harness, for all leather work requires constant feeding with oil in order to keep it fit and pliant, while the fake dries the fibers of the leather and starves it, rendering it liable to cracking and perishing. The branch of the artillery of which least is heard is that of the Royal Garrison Artillery, whose hundred companies are scattered about the British Empire in obscure corners engaged in the work of coast defences and the management of siege guns. It is fortunate for the garrison gunners that they have no long-faced chums to worry about, for they are admittedly the hardest worked branch of the service as it is. Gibraltar houses several companies. You will find some of them managing the big guns at Dover and at every protected port. They are big men all, strong men and lithe and active, for their work involves the hauling about of heavy weights, combined with the cat-like quickness in loading and firing their many pattern charges. The horse and field gunner have each to learn one pattern of gun thoroughly, but the garrison gunner, employed almost entirely in garrisoning defensive fortifications, has to learn the use of half a hundred patterns, from the little one-pounder quick-firer to the big gun on its disappearing platform and the 13.4-inch siege gun. The horse and field gunner may complete their education some day, for the pattern of field gun changes but seldom, and the present pattern is not likely to be improved on for some years to come. The garrison gunner, however, is the victim of experiment, for every new gun that comes out after being tested and passed either at Lyd or Shoeburyness is handed on to the garrison gunners for use, and there is a new set of equipment and mechanism to be mastered. In order to ascertain the quality of their work, one has only to get permission to visit the nearest fort, when it will be seen that the guns are cared for like babies, nursed and polished and covered away with full appreciation of their power and value. Garrison gunners suffer from worse stations than any other branch of the service. They are planted away on lonely coast stations for two or three years at a time, and Aden, the bane of foreign service in the infantryman's estimation, is a pleasant place compared with some which garrison gunners are compelled to inhabit for a period. Lonely islands in the West Indies, isolated places on the Indian and African coast, forts placed far away from contact with civilians in the British Isles, 
all these fall to the lot of the garrison gunner and the nature of his work is such that unlike his fellows in the field and horse artillery he gets neither infantry nor cavalry escort reckoned in with the garrison artillery are the nine mountain batteries which organized for service on such hilly country as is provided by the indian frontier form a not inconspicuous part of the british army in these batteries the guns are carried in sections on pack animals kipling has immortalized the mountain batteries in his verses on the screw gun a title which conveys an allusion to the fact that the guns of the mountain batteries screw and fit together for use the use of these guns can be but local for they are not sufficiently mobile to oppose to ordinary field guns on level ground nor is the projectile that they throw of sufficient weight to give them a chance in a duel with field guns they are however extremely useful things for the purpose for which they are intended they form a necessary factor in the maintenance of order on the northwest frontier of india and together with their gun crews they instill a certain measure of respect into the turbulent tribes of that uneasy land a consideration of the various branches of the service would be incomplete if mention of the royal engineers were omitted the engineers are looked on as a sister service to the royal artillery and consist of various troops companies and sections according to the technical work they are called on to perform thus there are field troops of mounted engineers for service with cavalry field companies for duty with the field army fortress companies for service in conjunction with the garrison gunners balloon sections and telegraph sections for the use of the intelligence department and pontoon companies for field bridging work every engineer of full age is expected to be a trained tradesman when he enlists and the special qualifications demanded of this branch of the service are acknowledged by a higher rate of pay than that accorded to any other arm the motto of the engineers ubique is fully justified for they are not only expected to be but are capable of every class of work from making a pepper caster out of a condensed milk can to throwing across a river a bridge capable of conveying siege guns there is no end to their activities and no end to their enterprise and in the opinion of many the engineers officers and men alike are the most capable and efficient body of men in any branch of the government service their work is little seen to their lot falls the task of constructing the barbed wire entanglements with the assistance of which infantry battalions can put up a magnificent defense against any kind of attack the engineers are responsible for the construction of the bridge by means of which the cavalry arrive unexpectedly on the other side of the river and spoil the enemy's plans by getting round his flank it is the engineers again who repair the blown-up railway line and permit of the transport of trainloads of troops to an unexpected point of vantage thus again upsetting the plans of the enemy one hears of the magnificent defence maintained by the infantry one hears of the brilliant exploits of the cavalry on the flank of the enemy one hears also of the skill of the commander who moved the troops with such suddenness and disconcerted his enemy but the work of the engineers who made these things possible generally goes unrecognized outside military circles and the engineers themselves have to reap their satisfaction out of the knowledge of work well done end of chapter six chapter seven of the british army from within by e charles vivian this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven in camp in going to camp transferring from the solid shelter of barracks to the more doubtful comfort of crowding under a canvas roof the soldier feels that he is getting somewhere near the conditions under which he will be placed on active service the pitching of camp especially by an infantry battalion is a parade movement and as such is an interesting business it begins with the laying out of the tents in their bags and the tent poles beside them near the positions which the erected tents will occupy 
the bags are emptied of their contents men are told off to poles guy ropes mallets and pegs the tents are fully unfolded and at a given word of command every tent goes up to be pegged into place in the shortest possible space of time at the beginning of a given ten minutes there will be lying on otherwise unoccupied ground rows of bags and poles at the end of that same ten minutes a canvas town is in being and the men who are to occupy that town are thinking of fetching in their kits under ordinary circumstances from four to eight men are told off to occupy each tent but on manoeuvres and on active service these numbers are exceeded more often than not during the south african war the present writer once had the doubtful pleasure of being the twenty-fourth man in an ordinary military bell tent the next night and thereafter wet or fine half the men allotted to that tent made a point of sleeping in the open air it was preferable life in camp is an enjoyable business so long as the weather continues fine and not too boisterous discipline is relaxed to a certain extent while under canvas open air life renders the appetite keener and one's enjoyment of life is more thorough than is the case in barracks wet weather however changes all this the luxury of floorboards is a rare one even in a standing camp and no matter what one may do in the way of digging trenches round the tent and draining off surplus water by all possible means a moist unpleasantness renders life a burden and causes equipment and arms to need about twice as much cleaning as under normal circumstances camp life breeds yarns unending and in wet weather or in the hours after dark men sit and tell hirsute chestnuts to each other for lack of better occupation if the weather is fine there are plenty of varieties of sport including the ubiquitous football to occupy spare moments but yarns and tobacco form the principal solace of hours which cannot be filled in more active ways there is one yarn which like all yarns has the merit of being perfectly true but unlike most is not nearly so well known as it ought to be it concerns a cavalry regiment which settled down for a brief space at Pochestrum after the signing of peace in south africa some months previous to the signing of peace a certain lieutenant of this regiment known to his men and his fellow officers as bulgy became possessed of a young baboon which grew and throve exceedingly at the end of a stout chain that secured the captive to one of the transport wagons of the regiment bulgy's servant was entrusted with the care of the monkey which after the manner of baboons was a competent thief from infancy and inclined to be savage if thwarted on one occasion in particular bulgy's monkey got loose and got at the officer's mess wagon it had a good feed of biscuits and other delicacies and retired at length followed by the mess caterer who expostulated violently both with bulgy's servant and with bulgy's monkey until a tin of ox tongue skilfully aimed by the monkey caught him below the belt and winded him after that as bret hart says the subsequent proceedings interested him no more well the regiment arrived at Pontchestrum and settled down under canvas with an average of eight men to a tent and the horse lines of each troop placed at right angles to the lines of tents bulgy's monkey was given a place away on the outside of the lines with the other end of his chain attached to a tree stump and there for a time he rested fed sparingly and abused plentifully by bulgy's servant in the regiment itself money was plentiful at the time and it was the custom in the tents which housed drinking men for the eight tent mates to get in a can of beer before the canteen closed over the beer they would sit and yarn and play cards until lights out sounded one night eight men sat around their can of beer in a tent of a squadron to which by the way bulgy belonged these eight had nearly reached the bottom of the can they had blown out all the candles in the tent save one which would remain for illumination until lights out sounded the last man to unroll his blankets and get to bed had just finished and was sitting up in order to blow out the last remaining candle when the flap of the tent was raised from the back and a hairy grinning evil face which might have been that of the devil himself looked in on the sleepy warriors 
they for their part were too startled to investigate the occurrence and the sight of that face prevented them from stopping to unfasten the tent flap in order to get out they simply went out under the flies anyhow one man tried to climb the tent pole possibly with a vague idea of getting out through the ventilating holes at the top but he finally went out under the fly of the tent like the rest taking with him the sting of a vicious whack which the hairy devil aimed at him with a chain that it carried while these eight men were fleeing through the night the devil with the chain came out from the tent and seeing a line of startled horses before it leaped upon the back of the nearest horse gave the animal a thundering blow with its chain and hopped lightly on to the back of the next horse in the row repeating the performance there in almost as little time as it takes to tell a squadron of stampeding horses followed the eight men of the tent on their journey toward the skyline and in the black and windy dark the remaining men of a squadron turned out to fetch their terrified horses back to camp and when they knew the cause of the disturbance to curse bulgy's monkey even more fervently than bulgy's servant had cursed it the end of it all was that eight men of a squadron signed the pledge and bulgy left off keeping the monkey it was too expensive a form of amusement this is a typical camp yarn and a military camp is full of yarns some better than this and some worse in camp more than anywhere else the soldier learns to be handy the south african war taught men to kill and cut up their own meat to make a cooking fire out of nothing to cook for themselves to wash up though most of them had learned this in barracks to wash their own underclothing darn their own socks and do all necessary mending to their clothes it taught cavalrymen the value of a horse in addition to giving them an insight to the foregoing list of accomplishments it was for the first year or so a strenuous business of fighting but the last twelve months of the war consisted for many men far more of marching and camp experience than actual war service it was an ideal training school and gave an insight into camp life under the best possible circumstances its lessons were invaluable and much of the practice of the army of to-day is derived from experience obtained during that campaign one failing to which men and especially young soldiers are liable in camp life consists in that when they return to camp thoroughly tired after a long day's maneuvering or marching they will not take the trouble to cook and get ready for themselves the food without which they ought not to be allowed to retire to rest in the french army officers make a point of urging their men to prepare food for themselves immediately on their return to camp but in the english army this matter is left to the discretion of the men themselves with the result that many of them frequently go to bed for the night without being properly fed this course if persisted in almost invariably leads to illness and it is important that men under canvas should be properly fed at the end of the day as well as at the beginning and during the course of their work when under canvas in time of peace the authorities of most units reduce their demands on their men in comparison with barrack life it is generally understood that a man cannot turn out in review order or in burnish and fake with the restrictions of a canvas town about him in some units however this point is not sufficiently considered and as much is asked of men as when they have the convenience of barracks all about them the result of this is sullenness and bad working on the part of the men the short-sightedness of officers leads them to press their demands while men are in a bad temper caused by too much being put upon them and the final result is what is known technically in the army as an excess of crime a string of men far in excess of the usual number is wheeled up in front of the company or commanding officer to be weighed off and the number of men on defaulters parade or undergoing punishment fatigues steadily increases although in theory the soldier has the right of complaint if he feels himself aggrieved to successive officers even up to the general officer commanding the brigade or division in which he is serving in practice he finds these complaints of so little real use to him that he expresses his discontent by means of incurring a crime or in other words of getting into trouble in some way 
there is no accounting for this habit it is the way of the soldier and no further explanation can be given squadrons of cavalry have been known to cut all their saddlery to pieces and companies of infantry to render their belts and equipment useless by way of expressing their discontent or disgust at undue harshness the relaxation of discipline and the absence of barrack-room soldiering when under canvas is a privilege which the soldier values highly and it ought not to be curtailed in any way a pleasant form of camping which many units on home service enjoy is the annual musketry camp it happens often that there is no musketry range within convenient marching distance of the place in which a unit is stationed and in that case the unit sends its men one or two companies or squadrons at a time to camp in the vicinity of the musketry range allotted to their use the firing of the actual musketry course is in itself an interesting business and it brings out a pleasant spirit of emulation among the men concerned keenness is always displayed in the attempt to attain the coveted score which entitles a man to wear crossed guns on his sleeve for the ensuing twelve months and proclaims him a marksman in addition to this there is the pleasant sense of freedom engendered by life under canvas and the access of health induced thereby the soldier in common with most healthy men enjoys roughing it up to a point and life in a musketry camp seldom takes him beyond the point at which enjoyment ceases infantry units serving in foreign and colonial stations are frequently split up into detachments consisting of one or more companies and serving each at a different place this detachment duty as it is called as often as not involves life under canvas and it may be understood that life under the tropical or subtropical conditions of foreign and colonial stations can be very pleasant thing here as in home stations sufficient work is provided to keep the soldier from overmuch meditation time is allowed however for sport and recreation and even when thrown entirely on their own resources for amusement troops are capable of making the time pass quickly and easily while on the subject of camping there is one more yarn of south africa and the war which merits telling although it only concerns a bad case of nerves it happened during the last year of the war that a column crossed the motor river from south to north going in the direction of brantford and camp was pitched for the night just to the north of glen drift at this point in its course the motor runs between steep cliff-like banks from which a belt of mimosa scrub stretches out for nearly a quarter of a mile on each side of the river after camp had been pitched for the night the sentries round about the camp were finally posted with a special view to guarding the drift the northward front of the column and its flanks only two or three sentries however were considered necessary to protect the rear which rested on the impenetrable belt of mimosa scrub along the river bank one of these sentries along the scrub came on duty at midnight just after the moon had gone down he took over from the sentry who preceded him on the post and started to keep watch according to order though in his particular position there was little enough to watch quite suddenly he grew terribly afraid not with a natural kind of fear but with the nightmarish kind of terror that children are known to experience in the dark his reason told him that in the position that he occupied there was nothing which could possibly harm him for behind him was the bush through which a man could not even crawl while before him on either side was the chain of sentries of which he formed a part surrounding his sleeping comrades his imagination however or possibly his instinct insisted that something uncanny and evil was watching him from the darkness of the tangled mimosa bushes and was waiting a chance to strike at him in some horrible fashion he tried to shake off this childish fear to assure himself that it could not possibly be other than a trick of nerves brought on by darkness and the need for keeping watch when crash something struck him with tremendous force in the back and sent him forward on his face half stunned he picked himself up from the ground and the pain in his back was sufficient to assure him that he had not merely fallen asleep and imagined the whole business with his loaded rifle at the ready he searched the edge of the mimosa bush as closely as he was able but could discover nothing 
He had an idea of communicating with the sentry next in the line to himself, but since there was no further disturbance and nothing to show, he decided to say nothing but simply to stick to his post until the next relief came round. Suddenly the uncanny sense of terror returned to him, intensified. He felt certain this time that the evil thing which had struck him before would strike again, and he felt certain that he was being watched by unseen eyes. He was new to the country, as an irregular he was new to military ways, and he promised himself that if he ever got safely home he would not volunteer for active service again. The sense of something unseen and watching him grew, and with it grew also the nightmarish terror, until he was actually afraid to move. Then, by means of the same mysterious agency, he was struck again to the ground, and this time he lay only partially conscious and quite helpless until the reliefs came round. The sergeant in charge of the reliefs had an idea at first of making the man a close prisoner for lying down and sleeping at his post, but after a little investigation he changed his mind and sent one of his men for the doctor instead. The doctor announced after examination that if the blow which felled the man had struck him a few inches higher up in the back, he would have not been alive to remember it, and the man himself was taken into hospital for a few days to recover from the injuries so mysteriously inflicted. In the morning the column moved off on its way, and no satisfactory reason could be adduced for the midnight occurrence but residents in the district will tell you unto this day that one who has the patience to keep quiet and watch in the moonlight can see baboons come up from the mimosa shrub and amuse themselves by throwing clods of earth and rocks at each other it is a good camp story and i tell it as it was told to me without vouching for its truth any man who cares to go into a military camp by permission of the officer commanding, of course, and has the tact and patience to win the confidence of the soldiers in the camp, can hear stories equally good, and plenty of them. For, as previously remarked, camp life breeds yarns. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The British Army from Within by E. Charles Vivian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Musketry. Although the musket of old time became obsolete before the memory of living man, the term musketry survives yet, and probably will always survive, for laconic description of the art and practice of military rifle shooting. Musketry is the primary business of the infantry soldier and it also enters largely into the training of the cavalryman, who is expected to be able to dismount and hold a desired position until infantry arrive to relieve him. So far as the recruit is concerned, by far the greater part of the necessary instruction in musketry takes place not on the rifle range, but on the regimental or battalion drill ground, where the beginner is taught the correct positions for shooting while standing, kneeling, and lying. He is taught the various parts of his weapon and their peculiar uses. He is taught that when a wind gauge is adjusted one division to either side, it makes a lateral difference of a foot for every hundred yards in the ultimate destination of the bullet. He is taught the business of fine adjustment of sights, taught with clips of dummy cartridges how to charge the magazine of his rifle. The extreme effectiveness of the weapon is impressed on him, and the instructor not only tells him that he must not point a loaded rifle at a pal, but also explains the reason for this, and usually draws attention to accidents that have occurred through disregard of elementary rules of caution. For long experience has demonstrated that the unpractised man is liable to be careless in the way in which he handles a rifle, and the recruit, being at a careless age and often coming from a careless class, is especially prone to make mistakes unless the need for caution is well hammered home. At first glance, a rifle is an extremely simple thing. You pull back the bolt, insert a cartridge, and close the bolt. Then you put the rifle to your shoulder and pull the trigger, and the trick is done. 
but first impressions are misleading and the recruit has to be trained in the use of the rifle until he understands that he has been given charge of a very delicate and complex piece of mechanism of which the parts are so finely adjusted that it will send its bullet accurately for a distance of twenty eight hundred yards considerably over a mile and a half in order to maintain the accuracy of the instrument the recruit is taught by means of a series of lessons which seem to him insufferably long and tedious how to clean care for and handle his rifle an immense amount of time and care is given to the business of teaching him exactly how to press the trigger for on the method of pressing the quality of the shot depends very largely the musketry instructor gives individual instruction to each man in this, and the man is made to undergo snapping practice, that is, repeatedly pressing the trigger of the empty rifle, until he has gained sufficient experience to have some idea of what will happen when the trigger is pressed with a live cartridge in front of the bolt. When the recruit has been well grounded in the theory of using a rifle, he is taken to the rifle range for actual practice with real ammunition. He starts off at the 200 yards range with a large target before him, and in all probability the first shot that he fires scores a bullseye. He feels at once that he knows a good bit more about the use of a rifle than the man who is instructing him, and at the given word he aims and fires again. This time he is lucky if he scores an outer. More often than not, the bullet either strikes the ground halfway up the range or goes sailing over the back of the butts, and the recruit, with a nasty painful feeling about his shoulder, has an idea that rifle shooting is a tricky business after all. The fact is that with his experience of snapping, he had learned to pull the trigger, or rather to press it, without experiencing the kick of the rifle that kick felt with the first real firing caused an instinctive recoil on his part in firing the second time later on he learns to stand the kick and to mitigate its effects by holding the rifle firmly in to his shoulder and from that time onward he begins to improve in the art of rifle shooting and to make consistent practice for the recruit's course, the targets are naturally larger and the conditions easier than when the trained man fires. At the conclusion of the recruit's course, the men are graded into marksmen, who are the best shots of all, first-class, second-class, and third-class shots, and they have to qualify in each annual duty man's course of firing in order to retain or improve their positions as shots. Before the new regulations, which made pay dependent on proficiency on the range, came into force, there was a good deal of juggling with scores in the butts. One company or squadron of a unit would provide markers for another, and since the men at the firing point shot in regular order, it was a comparatively easy matter to square the marker and get him to mark up a better score than was actually obtained under the present rules governing proficiency pay however a man's rate of pay is dependent on his musketry and third-class shots suffer to the extent of two pence per day for failing to make the requisite number of points for second class in consequence of this supervision in the butts is much more severe and there is little opportunity of putting on a score that is not actually obtained a case occurred two or three years ago the fifth dragoon guards being the regiment concerned in which the men of a whole squadron made such an abnormally good score as a whole that when the returns came to be inspected it was suspected that the marker had had a hand in compiling what was practically a record the squadron in question was ordered to fire its course over again and the markers were carefully chosen with a view to the prevention of fraud in the butts after two or three days of firing however the repeat course was stopped for the men of the squadron were making even better scores than before the incident goes to show that there is little likelihood of frauds occurring at the butts under the present system of supervision and incidentally demonstrates the shooting capabilities of that particular squadron of men bad shots are the trial of instructors who are held more or less responsible for the musketry standard of their units certainly more if there are too many bad shots in any particular unit 
The bad shot is usually a nervous man who cannot keep himself and his rifle steady at the moment of firing, though drink, too much of it, plays a large part in the reduction of musketry scores. At any rifle range used by regular troops, during the carrying out of the annual course, one may see the musketry instructor lying beside some man at the firing point, instructing him where to aim, pointing out the error of the last shot, and telling the soldier how to correct his aim for the next, generally helping to keep up the average of the regiment or battalion. As a rule, there is no man more keen on his work than the musketry instructor, who is usually a very good shot himself, as well as being capable of imparting the art of shooting to others. The great musketry school of the British Army, so far as home service goes, is at Hythe, where all instructors have to attend a class to qualify for instructorship. Here the theory and practice of shooting are fully taught. A man at height thinks shooting, dreams shooting, talks shooting, and shoots all the time of his course. He is initiated into the mysteries of trajectory and wind pressure, taught all about muzzle velocity and danger zone, while the depth of grooving in a rifle barrel is mere child's play to him. He is taught the minutiae of the rifle and comes back to his unit knowing exactly why men shoot well and why they shoot badly. He is then expected to impart his knowledge, or some of it, to the recruits of the unit and to supervise the shooting of the trained men as well. In course of time, constantly living in an atmosphere of rifle shooting and spending more time and ammunition on the range than any other man of his unit, he becomes one of the best shots, though seldom the very best for rifle shooting is largely a matter of aptitude, and some men, after their recruits' training and a dutyman's course on the range, can very nearly equal the scores compiled by the musketry instructor. Since shooting is a matter of aptitude to a great extent, it follows that the present system, punishing men for bad shooting by deprivation of pay and in other ways, is not a good one. It has not increased the standard of shooting to any appreciable extent. Men do not shoot better because they know their rate of pay depends on it, for they were shooting as well as they could before. Certainly the man who can shoot well is of greater value in the firing line than the one who shoots badly, but apart from this all men are called on to do the same duty, and the third-class shot, if normally treated, has as much to do, does it just as well, and is entitled to as much pay for it as the marksman. There can be no objection to a system which rewards good shooting, but that is an entirely different matter from penalizing bad shooting, as is done at present. The penalties do not always stop at deprivation of pay. In some infantry units, a third-class shot is regarded as little better than a defaulter. He has extra drill piled on him, drill which has nothing at all to do with the business of learning to shoot. He is liable for fatigues from which other men are excused, and altogether is regarded to a certain extent as incompetent in other things besides marksmanship. This naturally does not improve his shooting capabilities. He gets disgusted with things as they are, knows that, since his commanding officer has determined things shall be no better for him, it is no use hoping for a change, and, with a feeling of disgust, resolves that, since in his next annual course he cannot possibly put up a better score, he will put up a worse. It is the way in which the soldier reasons, and there is no altering it. The way in which men are disciplined makes them reason so, and the determination to make a worse score, since a better is impossible, is on a par with the action of a cavalry squadron in cutting its saddlery to pieces because the men are disgusted with the ways of an officer or non-commissioned officer. Thus, in the case of unduly severe action on the part of commanding officers, the pay regulations, which make musketry a factor in the rate of pay, have done little good to shooting among the men. When actually at the firing point, a soldier is taught that he must keep his rifle pointing up the range, for accidents happen easily, and in spite of the extreme caution of officers and instructors, hardly a year goes by without some accidental shooting to record. 
the wonder is not that this sort of thing happens but that it does not happen more often for until a soldier has undergone active service and seen how easily fatal results are produced with a rifle it seems impossible to make him understand the danger attaching to careless use of the weapon one may find a man so long as he is not being watched calmly loading a rifle and closing the bolt with the muzzle pointing at the ear of a comrade it is not a frequent occurrence but it happens all the same and in consequence accidents happen the range and the annual course are productive of a good deal of amusement at times there is a story of an officer who pointed out to a man that every shot he was firing was going three feet to the right of the target and who after pointing this out several times at last ordered the man to stop firing while he telephoned up to the butts and ordered that that particular target should be moved three feet to the right whether the result justified the change is not recorded cases are not uncommon in which a man fires on the wrong target by mistake especially at the long ranges and there is at least one well-authenticated case of a man who put all his seven shots onto the next man's target and of course scored nothing for himself for the law of the range is that if a man plants a shot on another man's target the other man gets the benefit of the points scored by that shot the markers in the butts must mark up what they see for if they were compelled to go by instructions from the firing point and had to disregard the evidence of the targets a musketry course would be extremely complicated business and would last forever one oft-told story is that of the recruit who sent shot after shot over the back of the butts in spite of the repeated instructions of the musketry instructor to take a lower aim at last probably being tired of being told to aim low the recruit dropped his rifle muzzle to such an extent that the bullet struck the ground about halfway up the range and went on its course as a whizzing ricochet missed again said the instructor in disgust yes said the recruit but i reckon the target fell to draft that time anyhow the recruit's course of musketry ends on the short ranges but when the duty man comes to fire for the year he is taken back a hundred yards at a time until he is distant a thousand yards from the target this distance a thousand yards is considered the limit of effective rifle fire though a good shot can do a considerable amount of damage at two thousand yards and the limit of range of the lee enfield magazine rifle the one in use in the british army extends to twenty eight hundred yards the weight of the bullet is so small however that at the long distances atmospheric conditions and especially wind have a great influence on the course of its flight while the power of human sight is also a factor in limiting the effective range even at a thousand yards a man looks a very small thing while at two thousand yards he is a mere dot and it is impossible to take more than a general aim more might be accomplished with more delicately adjusted sights and wind gauges but those at present in use are quite sufficiently delicate for purposes of campaigning and telescopic sights or appliances of a delicate nature for bettering shooting are quite out of the question for use by the rank and file most of the shooting of the army is done at ranges between five hundred and a thousand yards and whatever weapon science may produce for the use of the soldier it is unlikely that these distances will be greatly increased since even science cannot overcome the limitations to which humanity is subject up to a few years ago the old-fashioned bull's-eye targets were employed at all ranges and for all purposes but they have been practically discarded now in favor of targets which reproduce as accurately as possible the actual targets at which men have to aim in war the modern target is made up of a white portion representing the sky and a shot on this portion counts for nothing at all the lower part of the target is dull mud-colored and in the middle projecting a little way into the white portion is a black area corresponding roughly in shape and size to the head and shoulders of a man shots on this black portion which may be considered as a man looking over a bank of earth count as bull's-eye 
and shots on the mud-coloured portion of the target have also a certain value for it is considered that if a shot goes sufficiently near the figure of the man to penetrate the earth that the target represents such a shot under actual conditions would possibly ricochet and kill the man and in any case would fling up such a cloud of dust or shower of mud and stones as to wound him in some way or at least put him out of action for a few minutes further rapid individual fire plays a far greater part in modern rifle shooting than it did a few years ago the volleys which used to be so tremendously effective in the days of muzzle loading and slow fire at short ranges are little considered under present conditions with the development of initiative and the introduction of open order in the firing line men are taught to fire rapidly by means of exposing the targets for a second or two at a time two shots or more to be got on the target at each exposure in the musketry course of ten years ago there was very little rapid firing but now it takes up more than half of the total of exercises on the range apart from the annual course of musketry which men are compelled to undergo they are encouraged to practice shooting throughout the year by means of competitions financed out of regimental funds and offering prizes to be won in open competition competitors are graded into the respective classes in which their last course left them and prizes are offered in each class though why silver spoons should be offered to such an extent as they are is one of the mysteries that no man can explain certain it is that in nearly every shooting competition held silver spoons are offered as prizes and a soldier has little use for an ordinary teaspoon silver or otherwise the scores put on by the men of the army taken in the average go to prove that british soldiers have little to learn from those of other nations in the matter of shooting the marksman in order to win the right to wear crossed guns on his sleeve has to put up a score which even a bisley crack shot would not despise and yet the number of men to be seen walking out with crossed guns on their sleeves is no inconsiderable one while first-class shots are plentiful in all units of the cavalry and infantry artillery men of course know little about the rifle and its use their weapon both of offence and defence is the big gun and in the matter of rifle shooting they trust to their escort of cavalry or infantry usually the latter except in the case of horse artillery taken in the mass the british soldier has every reason to congratulate himself on the way in which he uses his rifle and the present continental war has proved that he is every whit as good at using the rifle in the field as he is on the range though in shooting on active service the range of the object has to be found while in all shooting practice in time of peace it is known and the sights correctly adjusted before the man begins to fire an adjunct to the course of musketry is that of judging distance in which men are taken out and asked to estimate distances of various objects even for this there is a system of training and men are instructed to consider how many times a hundred yards will fit into the space between them and the given object they are taught how conditions of light and shade affect the apparent distance how with the sun shining from behind the observer onto the object the distance appears less than when the sun is shining from behind the object onto the observer they are taught at first to estimate short distances and the range of objects chosen for experiment is gradually increased in this again aptitude plays a considerable part some men can judge distance from observation only with marvellous accuracy while others never get the habit of making correct estimates an interesting method practised in order to ascertain distance consists in taking the estimates of a number of men and then striking an average with any number of men over ten from whom to obtain the average a correct estimate of the distance is usually obtained another method consists in observing how much of an object of known dimensions can be seen when looking through a rifle barrel after the bolt of the rifle has been withdrawn for the purpose 
since however the object of training in judging distance is to enable a man to make an individual estimate neither of these methods is permitted to be used in the judging when points are awarded the award of points by the way counts toward the total number of points in the annual musketry course end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of the British Army from Within by E. Charles Vivian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine: The Internal Economy of the Army. Given such a conscript army as can be seen in working in any continental nation, there is a very good reason for keeping the rate of pay for the rank and file down to as low a standard as possible. For the state concerned in the upkeep of a conscript army puts all or in any case the greater part of its male citizens through the mill of military service and not only puts them through but compels them to go through it thus stands to reason that as the men serve by compulsion there is no need to offer good rates of pay as an inducement to serve further it is to the interest of the state concerned to keep down the expense attendant on the maintenance of its army as much as possible and for these two reasons if for no other the rate of pay in continental armies is remarkably small with a volunteer army however the matter must be looked at in a different light it is in the interest of the state of course that expenses in connection with its army should be kept as low as possible but there the analogy between conscript and volunteer rates of pay ends if the right class of man is to be induced to volunteer for service he must be offered a sufficient rate of pay to make military service worth his while in time of peace at any rate the ideal rate of pay would be attained if the state would consider itself so far as its army is in question in competition with other employers of labor and would offer a rate of pay commensurate with the services demanded of its employees by that method the right class of man would be persuaded to come forward in sufficient numbers and the army could be maintained at strength without trouble the British Army is the only voluntary one among the armies of the Western world, and for some time past it has experienced difficulty in obtaining a sufficiency of recruits to keep it up to strength, as was evidenced by the series of recruiting advertisements in nearly all daily papers of the kingdom with which the year 1914 opened. Statistics go to prove that recruiting is not altogether a matter of arousing patriotism, but is dependent on the state of the labor market to a very great extent. In the years following on the South African War, there was a larger percentage of unemployed in the kingdom than at normal times, and consequently recruiting flourished men of the stamp that the army wants finding nothing better to do and often being uncertain where the next meal was to come from enlisted and the army had no trouble in maintaining itself at strength although the rate of pay that it offered was lower than that earned in many cases by the ordinary unskilled laborer gradually however commercial conditions began to improve and for the past year or two in consequence of a very small percentage of unemployment among the laboring classes recruiting has suffered the army does not offer as much as the ordinary civilian employer either in wages or conditions of life and consequently men will not enlist as long as they can get something to do in a regular way hence the war office advertisements which had very little effect on the recruiting statistics and were wrongly conceived so far as appealing to the right class of man was in question it was not until lord kitchener had assumed control of the war office that the advertisements emanating from that establishment made a real personal appeal to the recruit the two events may have been coincidence for the war has pushed up recruiting as a war always does again there may have been something in the fact that kitchener as well as being an ideal organizer of men is a great psychologist however this may be the fact remains that although the war office by the mere fact of its advertising has entered the labor market as a competitor with civilian employers it has not yet offered any inducement equal to that offered by civilian employers the rate of pay for the rank and file is still under two shillings a day with lodging and partial board 
for in time of peace the rations issued to the soldier do not form a complete allowance of food, and even the messing allowance is in many cases insufficient to provide sufficient meals. The soldier has to supplement both rations and messing out of his pay. When all allowances and needs have been accounted for, the amount of pay that a private soldier can fairly call his own to spend as he likes is about a shilling a day, and civilian employment as a rule offers more than that. Moreover, modern methods of warfare call for a more intelligent and better educated man than was the case fifty years ago. The soldier of today, as has already been remarked, has not only to be able to obey, but also to exercise initiative. A better class of man is required, and though the factor of numbers is still the greatest factor in any action that may be fought between opposing armies, the factor of intelligence and elementary scientific knowledge is one that grows in importance year by year. The mass of recruits in time of peace is drawn from among the unemployed, unskilled laborers of the country though by the rate of pay given the country effects a certain savings this is more than balanced by the difficulty of educating and training these men to say nothing of the expense of it a higher rate of pay would attract a better class of man and provide a more intelligent army one of greater value to the state and even assuming that the class of man obtained at present is as good as need be still the rate of pay is insufficient the work men are called on to perform, the responsibilities that are entailed on them in the course of their work, deserve a higher rate of pay than these men obtain at present. An illustration of this will serve far better than mere statement of the fact. It is well known that for years past there has been some difficulty in obtaining a sufficiency of officers for cavalry regiments, but what is not so well known is that when a troop of cavalry is short of a lieutenant to lead it at drill and assume responsibility for its working, the troop sergeant takes command and control of the troop. At the best, the pay of the troop sergeant cannot be reckoned at more than four shillings a day, and on that amount of salary, twenty-eight shillings a week, he is given charge and control of somewhere about thirty men, together with horses, saddlery, and other government property to the value of not less than eighteen hundred pounds. For the safety and good order of this amount of property, he is almost entirely responsible, as well as being charged with the superintendence, instruction, and control of the thirty men or more who comprise the troop under his command. The fact is that the world has moved forward tremendously during the past thirty or forty years, while, except for small and inadequate changes in the rates of pay, the army has stood still labor conditions have altered in every way and the cost of living has increased forcing up the wage rate the army has taken note of none of these things but has gone on as regards pay and allowances in the way of forty years ago the necessity for an advertising campaign proved that the old ways were beginning to fail and efforts were being made to overcome the shortage of men without increasing the rates of pay vain efforts if statistics of the amount of recruiting done before and after the beginning of the advertising campaign count for anything we may leave these larger considerations to come down to a view of the interior working of a unit its pay feeding and general life all arrangements as regards pay for infantrymen are managed by the color sergeants of the companies, while in the cavalry and artillery the squadron or battery quartermaster sergeants have control of the pay sheets. These non-commissioned officers are charged with the business of drawing weekly the amount of pay required by their respective companies, squadrons, or batteries, and paying out the same to the men under the supervision of the company, squadron, or battery officers. The presence of the officer at the pay table is a nominal business in most cases, and the non-commissioned officer does all the work, while in every case he is held responsible for any errors that may occur. Each man is given a stated weekly rate of pay, and at the end of each month there is a general settling up, at which the accounts of each man are explained to him. He is told what debts he has incurred to the regimental tailor, the bootmaker, or for new clothing that he has been compelled to purchase to make good deficiencies. 
In every unit each man is charged two or three pence a month, and sometimes more, by way of barrack damage, which includes the repair of broken windows, etc., and altogether the compulsory stoppages from pay generally amount to not less than two shillings per man per month. The system of pay is a complicated one. As a bedrock minimum, there is a regular rate of pay of a shilling and a penny a day for an infantryman, and a penny or tuppence a day more for the other arms of the service. On to this is added the messing allowance of threepence a day, which is spent for the men in supplementing their ration allowance of food, and never reaches them in coin at all. There is a clothing allowance, which goes to defray the expenses attended on the renewal of articles of attire. There is yet another allowance for the upkeep of clothing and kit. There is the proficiency pay, to which each man becomes entitled after a certain amount of service, and which consists of varying grades according to the musketry standard and character of the man. This ranges from fourpence to sixpence a day, and then there is badge pay, which adds a penny or tuppence a day to old soldiers' pay, so long as they behave themselves. The color sergeant or quartermaster sergeant has to keep account of all these small items, and it is small matter for wonder that many a worried officer or non-com, puzzling his brains over the intricacies of a pay sheet, expresses an earnest wish that the whole complicated system may be swept away and a straightforward rate of pay for each man substituted the army pay corps a non-combatant branch of the service is charged with the business of auditing and keeping account straight and this corps forms the final court of appeal for all matters connected with the pay of the soldier the Royal Warrant for Pay, a bulky volume published annually, is the manual by which the Pay Corps is guided to its decisions, and from which the harassed color sergeant or quartermaster sergeant derives inspiration for his work. In all units serving at home, and in most of those serving abroad, a system of messing is established regimentally to supplement the ration allowances. Rations for the soldier, by the way, consist in England of one pound of bread and three-quarters of a pound of meat with bone per day, and all else must be bought out of pay and messing allowance. In colonial stations, the ration allowance is enlarged to include certain vegetables, and in India the scale is still more liberal, but it is obvious that the English ration of bread and meat is not sufficient for the needs of the soldier, nor will the official messing allowance of threepence per day per man altogether compensate for ration deficiencies. Beyond doubt, however, the provision of necessaries has been brought to a very fine art in the army, and with an efficient cook sergeant in charge of the regimental cookhouse, and capable caterers to supervise purchases for the messing account, with an allowance of four pence a day per man the rank and file can have a sufficiency of plain wholesome food the sergeant cook in charge of the cookhouses of each unit must have passed through a course at the aldershot school of cookery before he can undertake the duties of his post but he is the only trained cook in each unit Men are chosen as company cooks or squadron cooks haphazard, and often with too little regard to their fitness for their posts. In spite of all disadvantages, though, the average of cooking in the army is good, especially when one considers the unpromising material with which the cooks have to deal. The contract price for army meat is not half that paid per pound by the civilian buyers. It is, of course, all foreign meat that is supplied in normal times. While the single men of the army draw their meat supplies daily, married quarters rations are drawn on stated days, and as the majority of the occupants of the married quarters are non-commissioned officers and their wives, it follows naturally that in getting their exact ration with regard to weight, they are given every consideration with regard to the quality of meat cut off from the lump. On married quarters day, the troops get a surprisingly small allowance of meat and a surprisingly large allowance of bone, for the regulation governing supply enacts that three-quarters of a pound of meat with bone shall be allowed for each soldier. 
that with bone may mean that two-thirds of the allowance or more is bone though the soldier has in this matter as well as in others the right of complaint if he considers that he is being subjected to injustice in any way the quality of meat supplied and its correct quantity is supposed to constitute one of the cares of the orderly officer of the day for the orderly officer together with the quartermaster or the representative of the latter is supposed to attend at the issue of rations of both meat and bread in this connection a word regarding the duties of the orderly officer will not be out of place these duties are undertaken by the lieutenants and second lieutenants of each unit who take turns of a day apiece as orderly officer of the day it has already been remarked that an officer does not really begin to count in the life of a unit until he has attained to the rank of captain and to the experience gained by such length of service as makes him eligible for captaincy in no one thing does this fact become so clear as the way in which the duty of orderly officer of the day is performed in the majority of units it happens as a rule that a lieutenant performs his turn of orderly conscientiously and well at times however it happens that a subaltern impatient at the fiddling duties involved in the turn of orderly regards complaints on the part of the men as trivial and annoying neglects to see that real causes of grievance are properly remedied and lays the foundations of deep dislike for himself on the part of the men of the unit one of the duties falling to the orderly officer is that of visiting the dining rooms of the regiment or battalion and inquiring in each room if the men have any complaints to make with regard to the quality or quantity of the food supplied if any complaint is made it should be at once investigated and if found justifiable remedied but the subaltern doing orderly duty far too often does not know because he has not troubled to learn the way to set about remedying a just complaint a very common form of reply to a complaint by the men is i will see about it and that is all that the men ever hear while they are careful never to make a complaint to that particular officer again since they know he is not to be depended on the attitude of some junior officers towards the men making a complaint is at times one of suspicion the officer seems to imagine that the man is doing it for amusement and not until he has grown a little and incidentally passed out from the rank in which he takes his turn as orderly officer does he come to understand that men only make complaints to their officers about things which are absolutely beyond their own power to remedy frivolous or unjustifiable complaints when proved to be such are very heavily punished and consequently men abstain as a rule from making them the orderly officer is not concerned alone with the food of the men he is supposed to visit the barracks rooms and see that everything is correct there he has to visit the guard of his unit once by day and once by night and see that the guard is correct and the articles in charge of the guard are complete according to the inventory on the guard board he is supposed to visit all the regimental artificers establishments once during the day to see that work is being carried on properly and he is even concerned with the quality and issue of beer in the canteen while at the end of his day's duty he has to fill in and sign a report to the effect that he has performed all his duties effectively whether he has or not his work correctly carried through is no sinecure business mention of the canteen takes us on to another point of military economy that of supplies of varying kinds apart from the actual ration bread and meat in each unit serving at home a canteen is established for the supply to the troops of articles of the best possible quality at the lowest possible price without limiting the right of the men to purchase in other markets according to king's regulations on the subject in effect however the tenancy of a regimental canteen by a contractor is a virtual monopoly and unfortunately for the troops concerned the monopoly is often made a rigid one there is a dry bar or grocery establishment at which men can purchase cleaning materials for their kits and all articles of food that they require there is a coffee bar where suppers are sold to the men and cooked food generally is sold and there is the wet canteen 
whose sales are limited to beer alone and where the boozers of the unit congregate nightly to drink and yarn in old time the wet canteen used to be a fruitful source of crime as crime goes in the army and general trouble but moderation is the rule of today and excessive drinking is rare in comparison with the ways of twenty years or so ago the wet canteen of today is a cheerful place where men get their pints and sit over them forming schools as the varying groups of chums are called and drinking not so much as they talk for they seek company rather than alcohol for the teetotalers of each unit the society known as the royal army temperance association has established a room in practically every unit of the service at a cost of four pence a month a man is given the freedom of this room and at the same time invited to sign the pledge which he generally does in any case if an a t a man is caught drinking to excess he forfeits his membership of the association and the right to use its room in the room itself a bar is set up at which all kinds of temperance drinks are sold together with buns and light eatables in the army a man refraining from the use of intoxicants is said to be on the tack and is known as a tackwalla members of the r a t a are designated wadwallas or bun scramblers by the frequenters of the canteen who are known as canteen wallas the word walla is a hindustani one which has passed into currency in the army its original meaning being the follower of any branch of trade or employment in the same way numbers of hindustani terms are in general use roti is almost invariably used in place of bread char for tea and pani for water all being correct hindustani equivalents Kamti, meaning small, and bus, equivalent to enough, or stop, comes from the same language, while scoff, in place of eat, is derived from South Africa, where it is common currency even among civilian white folks. Married on the strength in the army carries with it a number of advantages for the married man. It is a little galling, in the first place, to have to satisfy one's commanding officer as to the respectability of the intended wife before marriage, but it is not so many years ago that there was good reason for this. Once married, the soldier is granted free quarters for himself and wife, and the wife is allowed fuel and light up to a certain amount, together with rations, and an additional allowance is made in the event of children being born curiously enough however the size of the quarters allotted to the married men and their families is not determined by the number of children in the family but by the rank of the married man not many private soldiers venture to marry for their rate of pay is so low as to make the experiment an extremely risky one although the wife of the soldier gets if she wishes it a certain amount of the single men's washing to do by way of supplementing her husband's pay married off the strength that is without the permission of the officer commanding the unit is doubly risky for the wife of the man who marries thus gets no official recognition her husband has to occupy a place in the barrack room for no separate quarters can be allotted to him he has at the same time to find lodging somewhere among the civilian inhabitants of the station for his wife and children if there are any and if he is a good character he may be granted a sleeping out pass which confers on him the privilege of sleeping out of barracks and this is a privilege that he must beg not a right that he can claim as the married establishment of a regiment or battalion is necessarily small men frequently get married off the strength though how they manage to exist and at the same time provide for their wives on military pay is a mystery the most common explanation is that the wife whatever work she has been engaged in before her marriage continues it after the hardest part of the business is that neither wife nor husband in these circumstances can count on the possession of a home as those married on the strength understand it the private soldier married on the strength usually has entered on his second period of service that is he has finished the twelve years for which he was first contracted to serve and has re-enlisted to complete twenty-one years with a view to a pension 
Generally, he manages to get a staff job of some sort, from employment on the regimental police to barrack sweeper, or anything else that will get him out of attending early morning parades as a rule, though all staff men have to attend early parades when the orders of the day say strong as possible. The rule in most units is that the staff jobs are distributed among the older soldiers, for these are supposed, and with justice, to be better able to dispense with perpetual training than the younger men. As a rule, the appointment of any young soldier to a staff appointment, except such posts as that of orderly room clerk, for which special aptitude counts before length of service, is the cause of considerable bitterness among the older soldiers who are still at duty, and is usually attributed to rank favoritism, whether it is due to that or no. In cavalry regiments, especially, the ordinary duty men look for amusements when the staff men are dug out to undergo the ordinary routine of duty, either by way of annual training or on the occasion of a strong as possible parade. The duty man has his horse every day, and horse and man get to know each other. But the staff man, attending stables only on the occasion of his being warned to attend a duty parade, has as a rule to take any horse that is going spare, as they call it, and usually the horse that nobody else has taken up for riding is not a pleasant beast. And the staff man may be a bit rusty as regards drill and riding, so that the two things combined produce the effect of involuntary dismounting in the field or at riding school occasionally, or, as the soldier would say, dismounting by order from hind quarters. Taken on the whole, the staffman's day at duty is not a pleasant one, while if he ventures to complain to his comrades or grumbles in any way, he gets more ridicule than sympathy. Usually the duty man affects to consider the staff man an encumbrance, and in the cavalry even signalers during the time that they are excused riding and attending stables are told that it is easy enough to wag a little bit of stick about, why don't you come down to stables and do a bit? The reply generally makes up in forcibility for a deficiency in elegance, for the trooper is capable of maintaining his reputation as regards the use of language, of sorts. A form of staff employment which calls for a particular class of man is the post of officer's servant. It amounts to the regular work of a valet for first servant, and that of a groom for second servant, and is not always an enviable post, especially if the officer in question is short-tempered or bad to get on with. Officer's servants occupy quarters away from the duty men, and in the vicinity of the officer's mess in the case of single officers. Married officer's servants are provided with quarters in their master's houses. In addition to the officer's servants, there is in each unit a regular staff of mess waiters, both for officers' and sergeants' messes, while all non-commissioned officers from the rank of sergeant upward are permitted to employ a batman from among the men serving under them. The sergeant's batman, though, is not excused from duty, as is the officer's servant, but has to get through all his own work and then clean the sergeant's equipment, keep his bunk in order, groom his horse, and clean his saddle, in cavalry and artillery units, as well as attend all parades from which the sergeant has no power to excuse him. Every staff job carries with it a certain amount of extra duty pay, and this in addition to the fact of being excused from at least some of the ordinary parades of the duty officer, causes a post on the staff to be sought after by most men. There are some, though, who prefer to be at ordinary duty, and the man who is going in for promotion usually avoids staff employ, for the two do not go together. Among non-commissioned officers, as well as among the rank and file, there is a certain amount of staff employment, but it is a smaller amount, and a good deal of it is unenviable business. The post of provost sergeant, for instance, although it carries extra duty pay, is naturally not a popular business, for having control of the regimental police and being responsible for the punishments of delinquents on defaulters' drill and punishment fatigues does not tend to increase the popularity of a non-commissioned officer. The business of postman in a regiment is usually entrusted to a corporal. 
As a rule, the oldest corporal is chosen to fill this berth, and one just concluding his term of military service is practically certain to get it as soon as it falls vacant. But staff jobs for non-coms are far fewer, relatively, than for the rank and file, and outside the artificer's shops, the regimental orderly room, and quartermaster's store, practically every non-com is at duty. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of the British Army from Within by E. Charles Vivian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: The New Army. In the course of these pages, the remark has already been made that the British Army is in a state of flux. This is true mainly as regards numbers and organization, but with regard to discipline and training, no very great changes are possible methods of training may alter and do alter for the better from time to time but the basic principles remain since an army can be trained only in one way by the use of strict discipline and of means calculated to impart to men the greatest possible amount of instruction in the shortest space of time the more quickly a man absorbs the main points of his training the better for him and for the army whose effectiveness he is intended to increase in the new army of today, from which it is intended to draft effective men into the firing line at the earliest possible moment, rapidity of training is a prime essential. At the outset, owing to the enormous numbers of men who flocked to the colors, training was no easy matter, and for some time to come instructors will be scarce when compared with the multitude of men who require training in order to combat this instructors have been asked to re-enlist from among ex-soldiers who past fighting age themselves are yet quite capable of drilling the new men a minor drawback arises here however in that such of the instructors as left the colors before a certain date are out of touch as regards modern weapons and drill for instance, the field gun at present in use in the British Army was not generally adopted until after the conclusion of the South African campaign. In the case of the cavalry, again, important modifications have been brought about in drill and formations during the past ten years, while the charger loading rifle with wind gauge is comparatively an innovation both as regards cavalry and infantry it is not intended to imply that drill instructors who finished their color service ten or twelve years ago are of no use for in the matter of imparting elementary drill and the first principles of discipline to the recruits they are invaluable and far too few but in more advanced matters it must be conceded that the sooner the new army can instruct itself the better for the proverb about an old dog and new tricks may be applied to re-enlisted instructors and the new army, which is a whole bag of new tricks. It is essential that the new army should train itself at the earliest possible moment, and for this reason there are endless opportunities for the man with brains who enlists at the present time. The re-enlisted drill instructor will not accompany the men of the new army into the field, and as an army increases, a relative increase must be made in the number of its non-commissioned officers, while there are also vacancies by the hundred for commissioned officers. For the average man, however, it is useless at the present time to depend on influence and backdoor methods for promotion worth is all that will count and an ounce of enlistment today is worth a ton of influence that might have been exercised yesterday it is as true of the new army as of any other profession that there is plenty of room at the top the way to get there is by enlistment today and hard and patient application of one's work for a matter of weeks or months no man can tell how long the new army will last or what will be the conditions of service and strength of the army after the proclamation of peace one thing however is certain not while a first-class power remains on the continent of europe will conscription cease altogether between the urals and the atlantic or between archangel and brindisi it is quite probable that when peace comes again universal conscription will cease for there will no longer be an embodied threat in central europe 
the powers will have no more of that and the burden of armaments on the old scale must cease on the other hand however nations will maintain sufficient forces to enable them to insist on international justice the threat of the sword will always form the final court of appeal from the decisions of any arbitration body and while this is so a british army must always be maintained the existence of primal human instinct is fatal to the idea of total disarmament war may not come again for that is a contingency with regard to which none can prophesy but the fact remains that the best provision for peace is ample preparation against the chances of war thus the man who looks for a career out of the british army need not look in vain for there will always be sufficient of an army if only for colonial and foreign service to furnish capable men with all the careers that they may desire the other reason for enlistment less selfish and more vital has been expressed by many voices and by means of many pens the country has called and there are ugly names for those who without sufficient claims of kin to form cause for exemption refuse to answer the call with regard to the composition of the new army it may be said that the standing of the men has altered materially since the outbreak of hostilities though this is in keeping with the trend of thought and feeling that has been evident since the end of the south african campaign up to the end of the nineteenth century there still remained obscure provincial centres in which it was supposed that only wastrels would enlist with a view to getting an easy means of livelihood farther back this conception of the army was a very common one it is hard to say at what period of british history such an idea gained currency unless the employment of mercenaries previous to the time of the french revolution may have given it birth for long before waterloo the british soldier gave ample proof of the stuff of which he is made and there is not battlefield of history from which there has not come some instance of self-denial or devotion to a comrade which attests among the ranks of the british army the existence of the highest principles by which humanity is actuated but up to the end of the nineteenth century civilians could not understand the army kipling taught them a little but kipling's soldiers are all hard drinkers with a tendency to the slaughter of aspirates and various other linguistic eccentricities as character studies kipling's soldiers are masterly work but they bear little relation to the soldier of to-day who even as an infantryman is required to be an educated man in certain directions since he lives in a welter of wind gauges and trajectory decimal points and mathematical calculations with regard to the accomplishments of his duties the public as a whole has been waking up to these facts slowly very slowly but it has taken the world catastrophe of a general european war to shake the public entirely from its apathy and cause it to realize that the army is an agglomeration of men in the highest sense of that little three-lettered word there is to-day among all ranks and classes a realization of the good that is and always has been in the army there is a new interest in soldiers in military movements and in all that pertains to the theory and practice of war and this augurs well for the future of members of the new army both on duty and among their friends counting from the day that the nation wakened to the good that is in the army and the possibility of soldiers being at root like other men military uniform has become a matter for pride to its wearer and respect from those who from any cause are unable to assume the uniform as this war has knit together motherland and colonies so by means of this war the soldier has come to his own the new army is not a thing apart from the nation it is the nation the new army means an increase not in numbers alone for we may accept as a principle that the best will rule in a mass composed of all sorts from best to worst that is if we grant relative equality in the numbers of best and worst and of each intervening grade 
Periods of commercial prosperity have left the Army dependent mainly on the unemployed for its recruits, with a corresponding loss in education and moral tone. But the new Army is composed of men of all grades, actuated for the most part by the highest possible impulses, and asking only to be allowed to give of their best. Enlisting in this spirit, it is inevitable that these men should look upward, and thus the best will rule. For purposes of rule, the army needs the very best, for its own sake and that of the future of the nation's manhood. In gaining the best and their influence, the army will increase in social standing and moral tone, as well as in numbers. No man comes out from the army as he went in. There are many types, and with the enormous increase in numbers at the present time, the number of types will increase as well as the number of representatives of each type. Country youths, town dwellers, agricultural laborers, who often make the best and keenest soldiers, men who know nothing of what labor is like, skilled artisans, and men from the office, all come to the ranks of the army, which, shaping them to compliance with discipline, still leaves the stamp of individuality. The soldiers of the new army will come back to their ordinary avocations, bearing the stamp of military training, stronger physically and different in many ways, mainly improved ways. But the metal on which the stamp of the army is impressed will remain the same, for one is first a man and then a soldier. The instances of Prussian brutality evident today and an eternal disgrace to the German nation do not prove anything against the Prussian military system, but afford evidence that brutality is ingrained in the Prussian before he goes up as a conscript to begin his training. So whatever the characteristics of a man may be, the army cannot make a brave soldier out of a cowardly civilian, and it cannot make a good man into a bad one. It accentuates certain traits of character and drives others into the background, but it neither destroys nor creates. It is a training school which, taken in the right way, brings out all that is best in a man, stiffens him to face the battle of life as well as the battles of military service, and strengthens self-confidence and self-respect. The men who are seen to have suffered in character during their military training are by no means examples from which one can cite the result of discipline and army work, for it is not the training that is at fault, but the inherent weakness of the men themselves. The social standing of the majority of recruits joining the new army renders it ten times more true of the army of today than of the army of yesterday, that military training gives more than it demands, inculcates habits which, followed in after life, are invaluable, and makes a man, in the best sense of the word, of each one who joins its ranks. One thing that officers and men alike in the new army should be made to realize is that the possession of a good kit carries one half of the way on active service. The things that carry the other half of the way are not to be purchased. But the man who has undergone the rigors of active service understands the value of good boots, good field glasses, well-fitting and suitable clothing, and really portable accessories to personal comfort. These things, and an intelligent choice of them, go far to make up the difference between the man successful at his work and the failure, for although a bad workman is said to quarrel with his tools, a good workman cannot do good work with bad tools. In the peculiarly exacting conditions entailed on men by active service, kit and equipment should be of the best quality obtainable, and the choice of what to take and what to leave behind is evidence, to some extent, of the fitness of the man for his work. The most important item of all is boots, and in fitting boots for active service one should be careful to select a size that will admit of the wearer enjoying a night's sleep without removing his footwear. Care of the feet and retention of the ability to march are quite as important as shooting abilities, for the man who cannot march with the rest will not be in it when the shooting begins.
For the rest, it is wise to try, if not to follow, as often as possible the tips given by men who have been on active service with regard to the choice of kit and the little things that make for comfort, that is, as far as compliance with these tips is compatible with keeping the size of one's outfit down. The seasoned man, when talking of such subjects as kit and comfort, usually speaks out of his own experience, and his advice is worth following. The golden rule in the choice of an outfit for service is simply as little as possible and that little good. This rule, by the way, used to be applied to the British Army in another way. The new army, however, makes a difference in the matter of size. End of chapter 10